What's up, guys? This is Matt Singer from ScreenCrush.com, and today we're counting down the top five weirdest Marvel TV shows of all time. These days, Marvel rules the airwaves with shows like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Agent Carter, and their Netflix series Daredevil and Jessica Jones. But it wasn't always this way. It took Marvel decades to really get the hang of adapting their comics to television, and a lot of Hollywood's early attempts to take Marvel to TV resulted in some really strange results. And I'm not just talking about that Doctor Strange movie from 1978. This cannot be! I am Kali, goddess of destruction! I am Lilith, queen of demons, end of the flesh! And I am Ishtar, bloody Ishtar! And I am Morgan! You have failed! You have let me be defeated! Beg me to destroy you. Pray to me for death. Oh, please, sentient poop pile. Don't make me watch the rest of the Doctor Strange TV movie. Anything but that! While I await judgment of that wrathful poo god, let's get to the countdown. Starting with... Number 5. Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. Some people stand in the darkness, afraid to step into the light. And some people need to help somebody when the edge of surrender's in sight. People like Nick Fury, for example. Modern film fans know Marvel's master spy in the form of movie's ultimate badass, Samuel L. Jackson. When Fox Television decided to make a Nick Fury TV movie in 1998, they got the next best thing. Baywatch's David Hasselhoff. Yep, in this busted pilot for a S.H.I.E.L.D. series, Nick Fury is retired from the espionage game and now works as a... um... a minor, I think? when he's recruited back into S.H.I.E.L.D. to stop a reconstituted Hydra led by his old arch nemesis, Baron Von Strucker. As these things go, it's fairly faithful to the old S.H.I.E.L.D. comics, even throwing in the famous life model decoy robots that are supposedly so lifelike they're indistinguishable from the real thing. Yep, that definitely looks like the real David Hasselhoff, all right, who is completely ripped. I can't tell which one is which. It's like looking into a mirror. Is the real David Hasselhoff this one or this one? I really don't know. Shockingly, the Nick Fury movie was not a hit. Even more shockingly, the film was written by David Goyer, who went on to write some of the biggest comic book movies of all time, including Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy. You gotta start somewhere, I guess. On to number four. That's the new Fantastic Four. Stan Lee and Jack Kirby's Fantastic Four kicked off the Marvel Age of Comics in 1961, and through the years they've been one of the most frequently adapted Marvel comics, with animated series in the 1960s, 70s, 90s, and 2000s. Each version evolves with modern tastes and animation, and the 90s version has maybe the worst theme song in TV history. Fantastic Four! Don't need no more! That's ungrammatical! They're all pretty close to the Lee Kirby comics, with the exception of the 1970s version, which is known as the new Fantastic Four. That's because only three of the four classic characters appear, Reed Richards, Sue Storm, and Ben Grimm. Meanwhile, Johnny Storm has been replaced by Irvy, a robot whose name is an acronym for Humanoid Experimental Robot B-Type Integrated Electronics. Now, you might have heard the urban legend about this show that Johnny Storm, a.k.a. the Human Torch, was kicked out of the group by network executives who were worried that kids would see the cartoon and try to copy him by setting themselves on fire. It's a great story, but it's not true. Johnny was actually replaced because the TV rights to the Human Torch were held at the time by another company who were trying to give him his own solo TV series. All right, so that's why the Human Torch was MIA, but it's not really clear why the creators didn't just replace him with one of the other established Marvel characters who joined the Fantastic Four through the years. You got Crystal, Medusa, even Luke Cage. Any of these characters would be worthy stand-ins. Herbie, on the other hand, was basically a robotic sack of sh**. You want some proof? All right. Here, Herbie signals the Fantastic Four because he thinks he's found a secret code. It turns out to be the world's fastest talking DJ contest. If robots could blush, my face would be red. Here, a college kid asks Herbie to help him with his term paper. 
His response? Oh, I really don't know all that much about the subject, lad. Thanks for nothing, Herbie. I mean, it's not like you're a brilliant talking robot or anything. No big deal. And here's Herbie doing some basic calculations. Wait a minute. 666? Six, six, six? No wonder Herbie sucks so bad. He's a tool of the devil. A spy sent by Mephisto to destroy the Fantastic Four from within. What do you have to say for yourself, Herbie? Well, at least I'm working, which is more than certain people can say. I'm monitoring the whole planet Earth, looking for any danger spot. I'll tell you where the danger spot is. Right there where you're standing and ruining the Fantastic Four, you tin can. Sorry, Herbie. You're kind of cute, but you are anything but fantastic. Next up, number three, the Captain America TV movies. More than 30 years before Chris Evans first put on the Stars and Stripes, Captain America was the star of two made-for-TV movies that originally aired on CBS, Captain America and Captain America 2, Death Too Soon. Maybe there was something in the water in late 70s Hollywood, because like with the new Fantastic Four, producers once again made some inexplicable changes to the character's origin and mythology. Cap is still a military man named Steve Rogers, but he's not a 98-pound weakling who volunteers to test an experimental serum during World War II. Instead, he's a former Marine tooling around 1970s America in a red, white, and blue shaggin' wagon. In this version, it's Steve's father who invented the super soldier serum using some of his own blood. That's why, many years later, it's Steve who's the only one who can then use the serum to become Captain America, a costume crime fighter who also tools around in a red, white, and blue shaggin' wagon, this one hiding a high-tech motorcycle that can drive through empty boxes and even fly. Okay, that's kind of cool. You know what's not cool? This costume. What the hell happened here? To be fair, they did iron out some of the costume kinks by the second film, which even co-starred the great Christopher Lee as General Miguel. But yeah, that first thing is just a hideous mess. Right down to that goofy looking plastic shield. And in both movies, Cap is played by Reb Brown, a muscle head with all the charisma of a walking slice of meatloaf. Bad movie fans might also know him from the Mystery Science Theater 3000 classic, Space Mutiny, where he plays hero Dave Ryder, who Mike and the bots affectionately give an endless slew of nicknames. Crunch. Buff Hardback. Bob Johnson. Blast Thick Neck. Hack Blowfist. <laughs> The fact that neither of these Captain America TV movies ever wound up on MST3K can only be explained by an act of supreme mercy. Next up, number two, Fred and Barney meet the Thing. That's right, this bizarre 1970s series from Hanna-Barbera paired the Flintstones with Aunt Petunia's favorite nephew. Now, it's a little tough to make out in this YouTube clip, but that is the ever-loving blue-eyed Thing Chillin' in Bedrock with Fred, Barney, and Dino. It's clobberin' time, space-time continuum! This version of The Thing was a solo hero who had nothing to do with the Fantastic Four. Instead, Ben Grimm is a shrimpy teenager who can become The Thing whenever he wants by bashing two rings together and saying, Thing ring, do your thing! <laughs> As a member of the Fantastic Four, The Thing saved the entire universe on countless occasions. As a member of the cast of Fred and Barney Meet the Thing, he resolves financial disputes at a local carnival, puts an end to ski slope bullying, and rearranges a messy parking lot. Way to solve that minor parking dispute, Thing! Glad you're using your incredible powers to make a real difference in the world. The only reason this series isn't number one on our list is because Fred and Barney didn't actually spend a lot of time with The Thing. The show's title is a bit of a misnomer. Fred and Barney Meet the Thing, which lasted on NBC Saturday Morning TV for just three months in the fall of 1978, packaged together Thing cartoons and Flintstone cartoons. But its stars didn't actually share the screen beyond those wacky opening credits. Hmm, too bad. I bet a guy with the last name Rubble would actually have a lot in common with a dude made out of big orange rocks. Now it's time for the number one weirdest Marvel TV show of all time... Japanese Spider-Man. Let's take one more trip back to the late 1970s, the golden age of weird Marvel TV, this time to Japan, where a licensing agreement between Marvel and the production company Toei birthed this highly unusual live-action series 
which ran for 41 episodes on Japanese TV between 1978 and 1979. This Japanese Spidey's costume was certainly more faithful than Big McLarge Huge's cap uniform, but just about everything else here was completely reinvented from the days of Stan Lee and Steve Ditko. Say goodbye to nerdy high school student Peter Parker and his radioactive spider bite. Say hello to daredevil motorcyclist Takuya Yamashiro, who's given superpowers by Garia, an alien warrior from the planet Spider, which was destroyed centuries ago by the evil Professor Monster and his Iron Cross army. After Takuya's father is killed by the evil aliens, Garia gives him a special bracelet that houses the Spider-Man costume and can summon the Marveler ship, which transforms into a giant robot called Leopardon. Toei's Spider-Man was actually a key series in the evolution of the Super Sentai shows that eventually spawned the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. And in that sense, it's an important moment in the history of TV. But as an adaptation of Spider-Man comics, I'm gonna go ahead and describe it as a loose one. Not only did Spider-Man have a giant robot he could use to fight bad guys with, he also liked to introduce himself this way. Not exactly with great power comes great responsibility. But what do you say, Poop God from Doctor Strange? You have great power. Will you be responsible in the use of that power and let me live? Your agony will be a comfort to me. Perhaps if your screaming pleases me, I may yet take pity on you. But now, look! Ah, a fate worse than death! For Screen Crush, I'm Matt Singer. Thanks for watching, and for even more, make sure to subscribe, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and get the latest movie and TV news on ScreenCrush.com.